Okay, so today we're going to uh, review the entire exponential functions, logarithms, rational functions, and function operations unit today. Um, that's a lot. There's a lot of stuff in this one unit. Uh, we are, of course, going to spend our Thursday Zoom uh, also going over all this stuff and making sure we understand all these old little pieces. Uh, I think function operations and even rational functions hopefully are pretty fresh for us, but those exponential functions and logarithms are what we're really going to need to focus on today. Let's get going. Uh, so again, the concepts that we need to cover today include exponential functions, growth and decay functions, logarithms, solving exponential and logarithmic equations, rational functions and their properties, which includes x-intercepts, vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes, and points of discontinuity, uh, as well as function operations. We are going to spend more time focusing on this stuff because it is a little older and it might be a little bit, uh, you know, more in need of refreshing. Uh, but the whole idea today is I'm going to pose a question. I want you to give it an honest try. Uh, the reason I'm wanting you to do this is so you can activate the little parts of your brain uh, and come back with this information. Uh, but if it isn't coming back, I, of course, am going to go over each question each time. Anyway, let's get going. All right, question one, solve for x. There's two exponential functions there that I want you to solve. Uh, pause the video here and give it a shot. All right, I'm going to go over this now. Uh, hopefully, you remember that uh, if at all possible, when you're solving exponential equations, try to make it so that both sides of the equation have the same uh, base power, right? So for a, uh, 3 to the power 2x and 9 to the power 1 half times x minus 4, both of those can have a base of 3. So we have 3 to the power of 2x equals 9 is just 3 squared uh, to the power of 1 half x minus 4. Uh, now on this right hand side here, a power of a power means you can just multiply those together. So this is going to be 3 to the power of 2x equals 2 times this right here. Well, two times this right here is quite convenient because it's just going to cancel out this one half. So it's a good thing I didn't actually double dip that through. So this is just going to be three to the power of x minus four. Uh, now, since they have the same uh, base, you can ignore the base altogether because this is really saying three to the power of something equals three to the power of something. Well, those some things have to be the same. So two x equals x minus four minus x from both sides. And you have x equals negative four. Perfect. Uh, if you want to test that, you're more than welcome to. You can plug in negative 4 into there and see if it works. Uh, rest assured, it should work. I, I'm just looking at it right now. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely should work. Um, but again, if you are not comfortable with it, you can always do that. Anyway, B, uh, 27 to the power of x minus 4 equals 9 to the power of x plus 3. This one also, weirdly enough, uh, you can get it so they both have a, a base of 3 on both sides. 27 is 3 to the power of 3, so we'll say that's 3 to the power of 3 the power of x minus 4 equals 9 is 3 to the power of 2 to the power of x plus 3. Do the power of a power thing on this one. It's going to be 3 to the power of 3x minus 12, because 3 times 4 is 12. Uh, this equals 3 to the power of 2x plus 6. Then you can ignore the, uh, the, the bases on this one and just say 3x minus 12 equals 2x plus 6, which, of course, if we bring all the x's to one side and move the numbers over, you're going to find that x is going to equal 18. So x is 18 is the answer to that one. Um, just a heads up, those ones were actually, like sorry to say, but those are actually on the easier side of things. It's not unusual for you to actually have to solve a quadratic or something when you go through these. These were just linear equations on both sides once we simplified it down, uh, but still you can you might have to just keep your eye out for those. Anyway, let's move on. All right, so we got a whole handful of logarithms I want you to solve on these ones. It looks like a lot, but most of these should go relatively quickly. Uh, watch, I'll end up eating my words when I go over it. Anyway, pause the video here, give these four questions a try. All right, we're gonna go over this now. I'm gonna start with A, log base nine of X equals negative two. Immediately, what I always do is I try to change it to an exponential. Remember the base of the log becomes the base of your exponent, so it's nine. Uh, and then the power of the base becomes the thing it was equal to, so nine to the power of negative two equals X. Uh, well, negative exponents are kind of garbage, right? So we prefer to write that as one over nine to the power of two equals X. And 1 over 9 to the power of 2 is 1 over 81. So x is 1 over 81. Cool. All right, anyway, b. Uh, same idea here. Change it so it, it's an exponential of some form. Uh, so x to the power of 3 over 2 equals 125. Uh, now, this, this one's a little bit weird. Uh, a, a fractional exponent basically just means we're doing the square root of x cubed equals 125. Uh, so maybe what we want to do on this case, uh, just to make our lives easier, maybe we want to square both sides of this, okay? 
you know, there's other ways to go around this, but uh, maybe we want to do that. We'll give it a shot. So if we square both sides of this, just give me a second here. I just got to calculate that. Squaring both sides of this, 125 squared is uh, 15,625. Uh, and then just take the cube root of that. So the cube root of 15,625 is actually going to equal 25. So the answer to B would be 25. All right, moving on to C. Uh, so for C, log base 3 of log base X of 125 equals 1. Uh, we'll, we'll play along with this one. Basically, if we turn it into an exponential, we can see it's going to be 3 to the power of 1, which is just 3, uh, equals log base X of 125, right? Equals the thing that was in the log in the first place. But what do you know? We have another log going on here, so we have to actually convert this piece now again uh, into another exponential function. So the base is X, the exponent's going to be 3, uh, and the answer is 125. So X to the power of 3 is 125. I don't need to use my calculator on that one. The cube root of 125 is just 5. All right, last question here. D. 7 to the power of log base 7 to 3 equals x. This is one of those rare questions where you actually might want to go to a logarithm rather than go to an exponential. So to turn this into a logarithm, we can say log base 7 of x equals whatever the exponent was, which was log base 7 of 3. Now from here, hopefully it's pretty clear. Log base 7 of something equals log base 7 of 3. Like just saying that out loud kind of answers it for us. X is equal to three. The only way that's even true is like if this piece is this piece, X is three, done. Anyway, moving on. All right, a couple more, uh, at least for logs here. Determine the value of X, log base two of X minus four minus log base two of X plus two equals four. And the other one, I'm not gonna read it out. Just pause the video here, give it a shot. All right, I'm gonna go over these now. Uh, notice, uh, first things first on this, this is like a log laws question, right? Uh, because you have uh, some logarithms that are being uh, subtracted together. When you subtract logs, and again, you can look at your formula sheet on this one to see the rule. When you subtract logs, it's basically like you can combine them together uh, to make a singular uh, logarithm. So in other words, it can be written as log base 2 of this divided by this. So x minus 4 over x plus 2. Uh, and that still equals 4, of course. Now that it's written like this, maybe we want to turn it to an exponential. So 2 to the power of 4 equals x minus 4 over x plus 2. Uh, and 2 to the power of 4 is just 16. So 16 equals x minus 4 over x plus 2. Uh, and then what we should do is we should multiply by x plus 2 on both sides. So this is going to give you 16x plus 32 equals x minus 4. Uh, and then I guess we can subtract x on both sides. So it's 15x. Uh, we'll move the 32 over equals uh, negative 36. Uh, and then that means x is going to equal some horrible number. Let's see if it actually makes a, a reasonable decimal here. Negative 36 divided by 15. Hey, that's actually reasonable. Negative 2.4. So x is equal to negative 2.4. That would be your answer there. Uh, now, just for logarithmic equations, uh, just at a good measure, I, I like, uh, you know, I like I like actually like plugging them in and seeing if it actually works on this one. Uh, and when we plug this in, uh, hopefully what you see is at least in this piece, uh, you're actually going to be taking the logarithm of a negative number. Uh, and you know, that just that just does not really sit well with me, uh, taking the logarithm of a negative number. Uh, so I actually think that this is a false answer. So it's not actually going to work. Um, you can't actually have a solution. So really there's no solution uh, to A. Uh, anyway, for B, uh, log base two of X minus four equals four minus log base two of X plus two. Well, that one, we should just move this piece over. So we'll make it an addition problem. Uh, I think you can probably see, you know, I'll even just write it up here. Log base 2 of x minus 4 plus log base 2 of x plus 2 equals 4. And when it's an addition problem, you can write it as a single log. Uh, and you know what, I'm really going to like just break this off so we have some more room here. Uh, you can write it as a single log on this case uh, by just multiplying them together. So log base 2 of x minus 4 times x plus 2, and that equals 4. Once again, write it as an exponential. We already know this. 2 to the power of 4 is 16 equals x minus 4 times x plus 2. I'm going to write that as a, a single full-blown quadratic here. That's going to be x squared uh, plus 2x minus 4x is minus 2x minus 4 times positive 2 is minus 8. Then let's bring that 16 over. So it's going to be 0 equals x squared minus 2x uh, minus 24. All right, so now we've got to think of two numbers that add to be negative 2 but multiply to be negative 24. Uh, well, those two numbers would be negative 6 and positive 4. So 0 equals x minus 6. 
times x plus 4, which means our solutions are x equals 6 and x equals negative 4. Uh, now, as always, we should uh, probably check both of these answers. If you plug 6 into this, you're not going to have any issues with getting a negative logarithm. So 6, I can already guarantee, 6 is going to work no problem. But if you try plugging an x as negative 4 into either one of these, uh, you're going to find you have a negative log. So just like what we had before, there's not going to be an answer to that one. So we have no solution there. The only solution to be is x equals 6. So again, this was a real trick question. I, I really don't like uh, that I was hitting you right out the gates with this one, but uh, it is what it is. You know, uh, the first one had no solution, as we found. The second one, though, absolutely did. Uh, another thing I'll mention with this first one, though, uh, is another thing you'd have to check is just for your NPVs. Uh, really, you'd have to say that x could also not equal negative 2. But I suppose that really doesn't matter, because if x was equal to negative 2, you would have had uh, a negative log right there anyway. So yeah, you know what? You don't even have to worry about it. You just, you just solve for the ones that work. All right, moving on. All right, so here's a rational expressions question. This was chapter 9. Uh, write the equation of each function in this form. Well, each function, there is only one question here. I just stole this from somewhere else. Pause the video here, see if you can write it in that form. All right, so uh, how I go about doing these questions is you have to break down what the A, H, and K are talking about here. K is your horizontal asymptote. H is your vertical asymptote. And A is your vertical stretch. But the easiest way to think of a vertical stretch is to move one point away from like the crosshair point between your vertical and horizontal asymptote uh, and then see how far up you went, okay? First things first, let's find our, the asymptotes. The asymptotes are a little bit easier to find. The horizontal asymptote is just y equals zero. It's just a flat line right there. Uh, so we can say right now, k is gonna equal zero. H on the other hand uh, is our vertical asymptote. Notice our vertical asymptote is at five. That's like if we had shifted this to the right by five. So it's x minus five, so h is five. Now with that, because we can see where our asymptotes are, notice the little crosshair points right here in the middle. If we go over one from there, the A value is just how high up you are from that. Well, notice the A value therefore has to be two because you're two values up. So we can see A is two. So to throw this all together, we can say Y is equal to two over X minus five. Uh, and then just for good measure, I'll say plus zero, but I guess you don't really need that there. Um, but there you go. Okay, moving on. Next one, the rational function, Y equals A over X minus five plus K. It's kind of like similar to the one we just looked at. Uh, passes through the points 6, 7, and 4, 1. Uh, determine the value of A and K. Uh, just pause the video here. Give this one a try. Those two coordinates, of course, are going to be important. All right, let's see, let's see how to do this. Like Full disclosure here, I haven't actually solved this one. Um, but here's how I'm going to try doing it. Okay, so we know 6, 7, that's going to be your X and your Y. So I'll say for the first one there, 7 equals A over 6 minus 5. Uh, do I really even have to write that? I'm going to say no. It's just going to be 1 uh, plus k. Uh, so therefore, I guess a over 1, we can might as well just say that this is going to be 7 equals a plus k. All right, good enough. Now let's use that other point. There's nothing else we can do with this one. Uh, using the other point, we can say 4. Oh, no, not 4. Sorry. 1 equals a over 4 minus 5. 4 minus 5 is negative 1 plus k. So I guess that means that one equals negative a uh, plus k. Well, if you remember from math 10, I believe, this is actually what we call a system of linear equations. Uh, you have two different uh, equations for the same variables, right? Now, since there's more than one variable, usually if you just had one uh, equation, you wouldn't be able to solve them. But because we have two, we can actually find a way to do this. Here's how I'm gonna do it. Yeah, there's a couple different ways that I'll just show you the way I'm comfortable with. I like isolating one of my variables and then using substitution to solve for that variable. So what I'll do is I'll get a all by itself on this one. I'll say seven minus k equals a. Then I can take the statement for equality for a and I plug that into this other one over here. So I'll say one equals negative and then instead of a I'll write that as seven minus k plus k. This becomes one equals negative seven plus k plus k or in other words one equals negative seven plus two k Add seven to both sides, you're gonna see eight is equal to two K, and therefore K is equal to four. And if K is equal to four, then that means we can come back here and say seven minus four equals A, and seven minus four, of course, is three, so A is equal to three. Anyway, moving on. All right, this is a more traditional rational expressions kind of question. 
Uh, analyze each function, or just this function really, and predict the location of any vertical asymptotes, points of discontinuity, and intercepts. By intercepts, we mean f x intercepts in particular, uh, but just for good measure, let's also find the y intercepts here as well. Pause the video here, give this one a try. All right, first things first, before you do anything with a rational equation in terms of finding all the information, factor it first. And by factor, I mean like fully factor this thing. So to fully factor this thing, let's start with the top. Uh, x squared minus 7x plus 12. This is a classic sum product rule kind of question. Uh, so two numbers that add to negative 7 but multiply to be positive 12, that would have to be negative 4 and negative 3. So we have x minus 4 times x minus 3. Now on the bottom, we have x squared minus 9. These, these ones used to slip you guys up, especially when you were in math 20, uh, but that's a difference of squares. Okay, so a difference of squares just means you can square root each piece. Uh, so that becomes x minus 3 uh, times by its conjugate, so x plus 3. So now that this is fully factored, we can hopefully start seeing some of the information. Uh, notice x minus 3 is on the top and the bottom, so technically those would like cancel out. Uh, but I'm not going to actually like fully simplify this or anything because it's not actually asking that, uh, for that for us. But instead, we're going to interpret this in terms of what we're really looking for here. What we're looking for are, are, are all of our little individual uh, points here. So our vertical asymptotes, points of discontinuity, and x-intercepts and y-intercepts. Vertical asymptotes are the ones that only show up on the denominator, okay? So they're the zeros, I should say, that only show up on the denominator. Well, x plus three is the only, like only shows up on the denominator. So we can say that x equals negative three, that is gonna be our vertical asymptote, okay? Because that is gonna be the point at which we'd be dividing by zero without it being on the top as well. Now your points of discontinuity are the ones that show up on both the numerator and the denominator. So we can say x equals positive three, that makes these two pieces equal to zero. That's gonna be your point of discontinuity. All right, so we got that one down. Now your x-intercepts are gonna be the ones that only make the numerator equal to zero. So that's gonna be x equals four. That is your x-intercept. Uh, but just for good measure, because again, they said intercepts, so not just your x-intercept, but also your y-intercept. We should also find our y-intercept here, but the nice thing is the y-intercepts are much easier to find. The y-intercepts are, again, just by definition, where x equals zero. So just plug x equals zero into this, and you're going to find where your y-intercepts are. Um, matter of fact, having it in factored form doesn't make finding the y-intercepts any easier. I'm just going to use this one. I think this one will actually make it way easier. If x was equal to zero, this is gone, this is gone, and this is gone. That leaves us with 12 over negative nine. And let's just see if that gives us a nicer decimal. Well, it doesn't give us a nicer decimal. So you know what, I'll, I'll at least reduce it as a fraction. We can divide both of the top, the top and the bottom by three. Uh, and I'll move the negative up to the top just for good measure. Uh, y is equal to negative four over three. That would be our y intercept. All right. Two more questions here, guys. Uh, I know it's already been pretty long, but uh, just bear with me. This is really important stuff to practice. And again, we'll go over more of this during our Zoom on Thursday as well. All right, uh, this is a function operations question. Use the graph of f of x and g of x to evaluate f plus g of negative four. This one should go pretty quick. Pause the video here, give it a try. All right, so f plus g of negative four literally just means uh, whatever f of negative four is, add that to g of negative four. Ooh, g of negative four, okay? F of negative four, it's this really pointy one here, F of negative four uh, is seven. So really this is seven plus G of negative four is one. So this is just seven plus one, it's eight. Like literally the answer is just eight. So we're good, okay? Not a big deal on that one, that one real quick. All right, question eight, this is the last one and it is a beefcake of a question. So buckle up here, that's all I'm gonna say. Uh, if you can't quite figure this one out, don't kick yourself, but it is a really good challenge one. I do want you thinking about this one. Um, it'd be interesting to see how many of you guys are able to get this, if you're willing to let me know. If h of x is f of g of x, then determine g of x, okay? Pause the video here, give this one a try. All right, so this one is absolutely nuts, okay? Uh, if you weren't able to solve it, again, there is no shame in that one. This one, like, honestly had me scratching my head. Uh, basically, we have to find some g of x that plugs into that x in f of x, because this is f of g of x, and it needs to equal this guy right here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to literally write out what I just said. Plug in g of x into here. We don't know what g of x is, 
but let's just plug it in. I'll put it in square brackets so it stands out. G of X, keep that all protected, all squared minus four equals this H of X, X squared plus six X plus five. Let's get G of X all by itself as much as we can. Add four to both sides, you're gonna see that G of X squared equals X squared plus six X uh, plus nine. Now, square rooting both sides is something that would be pretty challenging, right? Really, I think maybe it'd be easier to think of this as G of X times G of X equals X squared plus six X plus nine. The only way we can maybe figure this out is if we could try factoring this right-hand side here. So in other words, let's use our sum product rule. Two numbers with a sum of six, but a product of nine, well, that's gonna be three and three. Uh, so G of X times G of X equals, remember I said it was three and three here, that's gonna be X plus three times X plus three. Look how much we just left out here. This left side is G of X times G of X. They need to be the same thing. When we factor the right side, we have X plus three times X plus three. They're both the same thing. Therefore, we can determine that G of X is equal to X plus three. Woof, that's all I'm gonna say, holy Toledo. All right, so that's it. For practice, I want you to go back through any of the old week posts and uh, find any of your previously assigned practice questions and give them a shot. Uh, again, you could also uh, you know, wait until tomorrow's Zoom and then just we can talk about it a little bit more. Tomorrow's Zoom is gonna be very much like this. We're gonna go through just an entire gauntlet of questions uh, related to a little bit of everything. Uh, but unfortunately, given our time constraints on our Zoom, we can't usually go over as many questions as we can here. We've already been over 20 minutes on this one, uh, and that's not including however much time you spent pausing and trying them on your own. Uh, anyway, if you guys need any help at all, or if there's anything in this video that you're like, Scott, what on earth are you doing? You know how to reach me. Anyway, best of luck. Talk to you soon.